Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We start this session on time. First of all, I would like to say that thank you very much for attending APSC JCS webinar number four. This is a live web session. I am Takanori Keda from Toho University, Tokyo, one of the chairperson of this session. And the co chairperson is uh, Dr. Chin Chi Keong from National Health Center, Singapore. Before this session, I would like to briefly have the introduction of this webinar. The APSC is one of the key regional cardiology association aiming to facilitate the communication, collaboration, and professional development for the advancement of scientific and medical practice in cardiovascular disease in Asia Pacific region. This time, together with JCS, we are holding a webinar which is entitled New Horizon in Arisumia. We certainly hope would be an equally meaningful scientific exchange and interaction. In this webinar, we invited four speakers focusing on cassette ablation to eliminate atrial fibrillation, including current topics such as indication, techniques, and specific cases, and also leadless pacemaker and subcutaneous devices including update topics. I will chair first and the second talks, and Dr. Keon will chair third and the fourth talks. Let's get started this session. If the audience have a question, please click the Q and A button in the bottom of the screen. Let me introduce first speaker, Professor Teichi Yamane, from GK University, Tokyo. His talk title is AF Aberration, including indication and the result of different techniques. Could you start your presentation, Professor Yamane? Okay. Thank you, Professor Ikeda. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I've talked uh, about AFI vibration indication and results of different technologies. Is the thread okay? Okay. It is okay. Yeah, okay. we can see. Okay, thank okay, you. I will start. Uh, look at this title of the talk. It's uh, I'm very uh, what do you say, confessed or anxious about it, and it's very wide or broad indication and the results of different technologies uh, among 15 minutes. It's impossible to talk. So uh, I'll talk about the indication and results of balloon technologies for AFib ablation, especially about the cryo balloon ablation. This is my COI. Uh, my content is about uh, uh, cryobalan ablation, efficacy and safety for paroxysmal fibrillation, and indication and popularity in Japan. Approval situation in Europe, USA, and Japan, and ablation strategies for persistent FE, and cryobalan ablation for persistent FE. I'll talk about, the, I'll introduce about the results of the very new one, stop persistent atrial fibrillation, and compare the results with radio frequency uh, ablations and uh, future directions. As you know, uh, cryobalan appeared uh, maybe 2005 uh, in the clinical settings. And the results or effic uh, efficiency, as you know, is very impressive. Uh, in this, the first uh, stop AFib uh, uh, study, the results are about, about 70% of the success. Uh, these are the, uh, the early uh, days of the studies. Stop AFib, Stop AFib Pass, Europe study, and the Cryo Japan uh, PMS study. 
most of, uh, of them showed about 70 to 90 percent of the success for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And this is very well known that the fire and the ice uh, by uh, Professor Cook, uh, they show the similar efficiency and safety with the radio frequency ablation. Uh, the cloud balloon uh, shows us a similar results. It's very impressive. So my talk uh, is now is uh, current indication of the cloud balloon ablation in Japan and other countries. Uh, approval of cloud ablation in the world. Europe, it's very early. USA, uh, 2010. Australia, 2012. Korea, uh, two years ago. Japan, six years ago. And how about the approval for persistent AFI? Europe, two, 2014. Australia, Korea. But uh, do you know about the USA and Japan? I'll show it later. Uh, this slide shows the popularity of cloud barber ablation in Japan from the uh, All Japan Registry of the Casita Ablation, J uh, Ab Registry. Uh, compared to the radio frequency ablation, uh, the property uh, share is about 80%. The cloud balloon is about one fourth. Hot balloon and laser balloon is a very uh, low rate. So cloud balloon is about the one fourth. It's very popular in Japan, of course, in, in the world also. Uh, let's go to the strategies for ablation of persistent AFI. Uh, everybody knows that there is many uh, different technologies or strategies, including the uh, linear ablation, our box, or cafe, or stepwise, or uh, more recently, the uh, rotor ablation, or the uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the success rate for the persistent atrial uh, fibrillation is about 60%, even with the multiple procedures. It's maybe uh, disappointing. And five years ago, uh, the star F2 uh, results appeared. It's very impressive. Uh, they showed that the uh, additional substrate ablation, uh, in addition to the PBI, uh, did not show uh, improve uh, through the improvement of the outcome. It is cafe or line. And this uh, manuscript, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, this is a Korean result. Uh, they show the ablation strategies for persistent fibrillation before and after STAR F2. Uh, look at this uh, procedure pattern, one year recurrence, procedure related to the computation before and after. This is overall, this is propensity matched uh, results. Look at the extra PV area ablation. Uh, before STAR F2, nine, more than 90% required this uh, additional ablation. But after uh, STAR F2, about half. And the procedure type, of course, it's much uh, shorter after STAR F2. And the one year recurrence, its recurrence rate is even uh, smaller uh, after F2 without the extra PV ablation. And the procedure related complication is uh, the same, similar, but even uh, lower, smaller, like that. So additional extra PV uh, ablation may not be necessary, especially for the mild degree persistent atrial fibrillation. So uh, let's go to the cryobar ablation for persistent AFE. This is a very new one, heart reason impressed. Cryobar ablation for PV coronary veins for persistent AFE. Uh, this is called a uh, so-called stop persistent AFE trial. I am one of the uh, and uh, I participated uh, in the study, so I'm uh, included in one of the uh, authors. Look at this, Start, stop persistent AFI was a prospective mouth center single arm FDA regulated trial designed to evaluate the safety and efficacy of PBI only cryobar ablation for a persistent AFI. Um, and it's a continuous episode uh, less than 60, six months. Uh, this is a summary of the stop persistent AFib uh, trial. 
165 patients, 25 uh, US, Canadian, Japanese sites uh, participated. And uh, procedure time is about two hours. Uh, primary efficacy is uh, 55%. Of course, it's uh, much uh, better than the 40% performance goal. Primary safety rate is 0.6%. Good. And the freedom from uh, repeat abrasion is uh, about uh, nearly 90%. Uh, it's, uh, it increases the quality of life and uh, decreases the related symptoms like that. So uh, with this uh, good results, uh, Cryobarum gets FDA approval for persistent AFib. This is a web news. Look at this. This is June 29, very new. So now FDA approved uh, persistent uh, Cryobarum for persistent AFib. And now pharmacological, pharmaceutical approval was granted by uh, PMDA in Japan uh, also in June uh, this year. So this is a slide I previously showed you. Uh, now USA and Japan uh, at the same time approved uh, cryo vibration for persistent AFib. We, USA and Japan have been very uh, prudent or careful to accept the indication of cryo for persistent AFib. Uh, there are many, uh, 23 studies uh, which show the effect of cryo abrasion for persistent AFib. There are many. Uh, most of them from the Europe. Uh, the non recurrence rate is uh, between uh, from 41 to 82 percent. Follow up is uh, one uh, year to five uh, years or something. This is uh, all of our results. And uh, one of the advantages of the cryobarium abrasion is uh, uh, small center variation uh, between among center variation. In the, and for the persistent AFib uh, as well, cryo abrasion uh, shows the small center variation like this. Let's compare the effect of the cryo uh, effect with the radio frequent abrasion. Of course, the, the target is persistent AFib. As uh, this has showed, the, uh, compared to the uh, orange line, uh, graph uh, radio frequency, Blue cry cryo balloon showed similar or maybe the better non recurrence rate. There are no uh, significant difference between them. This slide shows the complication rate uh, comparing uh, the radio frequency and the cryo balloon. Uh, again, there are no significant difference between two, these two devices uh, like that. So it will be reasonable to perform cryo balloon PBI for persistent AFib with a shorter procedure time and similar efficacy and safety with radio frequency abrasion. Uh, future directions. Perhaps uh, expanding indication to long-standing persistent AFE, perhaps this will be the future direction. Look at this uh, results. Uh, this is a very new one, Europace 2020, this year, cryo for persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. Uh, this red line is persistent, and the green line is long-standing persistent. There is significant difference between these two, but the difference may be uh, not so large. I'm not sure whether it's a good idea uh, to use the cryo for the long-standing uh, persistent AFI or not. Uh, for me, I do not agree, but there are perhaps there, uh, this world will go to that direction from now, I think. Uh, number two, future direction, expanding approval for other balloon devices. In Japan now, uh, there are two other balloons, hot balloon and the laser balloon. Look at these results. Uh, this is also the, this year's manuscript. As uh, they compared the Japanese one, hot balloon, they compared the hot balloon and cryo balloon uh, for persistent AFib. Uh, they compare the region area, efficacy and safety. And uh, look at these two uh, uh, figures. 
This is cry balloon. This is hot balloon. Uh, because the uh, uh, hot balloon is uh, has uh, the bar we can uh, change the balloon size. We can expand. Uh, but the cry balloon is a fixed size. So the ablation area is larger in the hot, uh, hot balloon ablation. Maybe hot balloon is more suitable for the persistent AFib ablation. The last one, expanding the target of balloon to extra PV region. Uh, this is a uh, next by uh, Dr. Ariana. They perform the posterior box isolation by cryo balloon. The upper AB is uh, just uh, PVI, and the uh, lower CD is a uh, uh, box isolation uh, by the cryo balloon. Uh, in addition to the PVI, they perform the posterior wall isolation. And the result is like that. Uh, compared to the PVI only, the red line PVI plus posterior wall isolation shows the better results. So maybe it's good for the upper uh, bottom for the uh, box isolation, maybe. And the, this is the uh, uh, same one by the hot bottom ablation. Uh, but uh, again, the Japanese group, they perform the uh, PVI and the posterior wall isolation by using the hot balloon, moving the uh, very big uh, balloon like that. And they show the feasibility uh, of this technique, but uh, I don't like it. It looks like dangerous, perhaps, especially for the esophagus or uh, maybe the cerebral infarction, or uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about the future directions, but uh, today I talked about uh, these content, uh, contents. And my conclusion is uh, medicine always progresses. However, more than enough is too much. Sugitaru wa oebazaru ga kotoshi. Just good is often difficult. We must be careful to expand the indication of the balloon devices, I think. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. So we have time for a discussion. But actually, uh, no question from uh, audience. Mm -hmm. So I have one question. There are some ablation procedure for eliminating AF. So this time, you mainly introduce cryo ablation and the hot balloon ablation. But the other ablation procedure, such as the conventional RF ablation and also laser ablation. Of course, we will consider efficacy, but we have to consider safety and also cost effectiveness. Yeah. So my question is that, how do you decide about the sequence of those procedure for AF patients? Which is a first, first one, or cryoablation is the first one in the first session? Yeah, it's a thank you for your uh, nice question. Uh, it's a difficult, difficult uh, question to answer, but uh, uh, yeah, I think for the uh, persistent atrial fibrillation and uh, especially uh, it's a mild one. I mean the. Uh, maybe uh, the uh, duration uh, is uh, less than six months for the uh, left atrial uh, diameter is not so big. Mm -hmm. uh, we can use the cryo balloon ablation uh, mm -hmm. for the first uh, session, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and we should not do uh, any other uh, techniques or strategies in addition to the uh, cryo mm -hmm. balloon uh, or balloon uh, PVI. We must do only that. And mm -hmm. then, if the patient uh, recovered, we can do another uh, additional ablations. Maybe mm -hmm. it may include the uh, linear ablation or uh, sometimes rotor ablation or something. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the second sessions, I think mm -hmm. it's a good uh, cost uh, effective uh, uh, strategy for, uh, what do you say, uh, concurring or uh, targeting the persistent AFib, I think. Okay, and I understand. So, okay, second question. Yeah. You talked about a persistent and a long-standing persistent AF. Yeah. 
So could you tell me current status of catheter ablation for a patient with permanent, namely chronic AF? If you do a catheter ablation to chronic AF, what is the most significant limitations? You mean the limitations? Yeah, but first is, uh, are you doing a catheter ablation for a chronic AF patient? Yes, of course. Of course. So probably your success rate is uh, not so high. Yeah, so you're right. So want to know the most significant limitation. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to answer again, but uh, anyway, in the uh, current techniques, it's mm. impossible to uh, completely eliminate the uh, atrial fibrillation substrate uh, mm -hmm. in the atrium. And uh, so with, with any kind of the techniques or strategies, uh, there uh, must, uh, there remained mm -hmm. uh, uh, some or many uh, substrates even after the session. So mm -hmm. yeah, of course there, there are uh, limitations on the effect of the abrasion will be uh, maximally uh, maybe 70 or uh, 80% or something, okay. I think. Okay, probably uh, atrial you know, size is also big. So that's, yeah. that means that you know, many area we have to abrade. So yes. That is a very tough, that's a one of the you know, problem, I guess. Thank you. So from uh, audience, no question? From a speaker, do you have uh, questions to uh, Professor Yamane? Yes. No questions? Okay, oh, please. Thank you for a very good uh, talk on balloon technology. My question would be, how do you assess such technology with the high power short duration RF ablation? And of note, there'll be new technology such as a, a circular mapping catheter that could ablate you know, with various configuration whether with RF or with uh, electro poration. What are your thoughts on such technology? Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, today, uh, I focus on the uh, balloon technologies, but uh, uh, today's tema, original tema, uh, indication and results of the different technologies of the, for the strategies will include uh, your questions. Uh, for example, the uh, hyper short duration or the extrapolation or many things. Of course, I'm very interested uh, in the uh, new ones, uh, extrapolations. Uh, I saw uh, just saw some cases, but uh, uh, it's not available in Japan. Uh, uh, maybe we can use it in this in a few years, I think. And uh, about the uh, high partial duration uh, we are using now, uh, perhaps most of the operator, uh, operator uh, in Japan or perhaps in your country will uh, now doing that. And I think uh, as is uh, already uh, reported, uh, perhaps the safety, uh, uh, the efficiency uh, is good and the safety is better, I think. Uh, so uh, I like it. Okay, so now is uh, time is over. Let's move on to the second topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yamane. So second speaker is uh, Dr. Yoshihide Takahashi from Tokyo Medical and uh, Dental University, Tokyo. His talk title is uh, AF Abrasion in Congestive Heart Failure, Who, When, and How. Could you start your presentation, Dr. Takahashi? Thank you, uh, Dr. Ikeda. Firstly, I'd like to uh, thank our organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, webinar. So I'd like to overview the AF uh, Ablation in Heart Failure patients. So let me start from this uh, landmark study uh, from a Bodo group, uh, published in uh, 16 years ago already. So this uh, single center uh, observational study look at the changes in LV ejection fraction after AP ablation 
So mean LV ejection fraction was 35% at, before the ablation, but one, one month later after ablation, LVF increased to 50%. And then up to six months, LVF increased slightly. And beyond six months, LVF did not increase, but did not decrease either. So you, you may think uh, rate control before ablation was poor in most of patients, but actually half of patients had bad rate control, but in, in the remaining half, remaining half patients, rate control was uh, adequate. And uh, patients with uh, inadequate rate control, LVF changed significantly from 35 to 55%. But also in the patients with the uh, adequate rate control, uh, the ejection fraction increased up to 50%. So before this study, we, we called tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. But after this study, we said AFib induced cardiomyopathy. So not all uh, patients with uh, heart failure uh, reduced LV ejection fraction with AFib. Uh, rate control alone is not enough to improve uh, heart rate. But in the same year, this study from uh, Cleveland Clinic, they also they must, uh, look at uh, changes in LV ejection fraction after AFib ablation. So before ablation, 36%, but after ablation, uh, 41%. LVF increased, but only by 5%, and statistically not significant. Both studies are observational studies, single center, and the results are quite different. So at that time, we did, we did, we did not know why uh, clinical uh, increase in the LVF differed according to uh, studies. And 10 years later, this is, I think, a first study to uh, to uh, first randomized clinical trial. So patients were uh, randomized to ablation and uh, medical, medical uh, therapy. And this is a LV ejection fraction. Ablation group, LVF changed from 32% to 42%. And the medical treatment, LVF did not change, but slightly decreased. So between two groups, there is a statistical significance. But again, increase in LVF was not as big as a Bordeaux paper, about 10% increase. And a recent paper from uh, Australia, they, they also performed a randomized clinical trial. So patients, uh, persistent AFI patients, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, so they excluded uh, valvular heart disease or ischemic cardiomyopathy. And the patients were randomized to ablation or rate control. And uh, Ablation group had a significant increase in uh, LVEF by 18%, similar to a Bordeaux paper. Of course, uh, uh, between two groups, there's statistical uh, significance, but they also performed the MRI. And uh, uh, late gadolinium enhancement, if patients had left uh, LGE, ventricular LGE, LVEF was smaller than the patients without LGE. And this figure shows a, a very, uh, very nice uh, relationship between LGE and uh, changes in LVEF with uh, increase in the ventricle LGE, increase in LVEF decrease, uh, inverse relationship between LGE and uh, LVEF changes. So, if you perform uh, MRI before ablation, we can predict changes in LVEF. So ventricular fibrosis is uh, one reason why some patients increase, uh, does not increase LVEF. So uh, this is of course very, uh, very well uh, known, uh, famous uh, study, calculated. 
proximal AFib, persistent AFib, NYJ class two, three, four patients, and LBG ejection fraction less than 35%. And all patients had defibrillator. And this is the primary uh, outcome of this study. So death or hospitalization for worsening heart failure. So ablation was superior to medical therapy. Hazard ratio was 0.42. So uh, primary endpoint reduced by 40, uh, 38% so in ablation group. But please look at carefully this figure. So at the first six months, blue and red curve was exactly on the same. And then a red curve dropped a bit, but up to 24 months. Difference was not that big. But beyond two, two, two years, red curve dropped down. And finally, hazard ratio was 0 0.62. This is a, a couple of mere curve of uh, all cause death. So also this figure, up to three years, Two curves are almost the same, but beyond three years, medical therapy patient had a, a, a more often died. So one of the most important findings of this study was uh, when we treat a patient with heart failure and AFib, ablation improves uh, survival or host, uh, reduce hospitalization, but this event will occur three or four or five years later, very long, uh, long after, after, uh, after we uh, select a, a treatment option. So when we think of uh, a treatment option, we have to think of a long-term outcome of that patient. Sometimes the uh, patient looks very healthy but uh, this patient will die in the five years later. And another important uh, findings of this study is this subgroup analysis. So NYJ class two patient hazard ratio was 0.42. So ablation was very, very good, very, uh, very good. But uh, NYJ class three patients hazard ratio was 0.89 and uh, so ablation, medical therapy, almost the same. And a P4 interaction is 0.06. LV ejection fraction greater than 25%. Hazard ratio 0.48. So ablation is uh, good. But uh, LVF less than 25%. Hazard ratio was over 1, 1.36. So uh, medical therapy was a bit better. So if the patients, so this means that the patients are so sick, ablation will not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not good as, uh, uh, not good. So NYJ class three or LBF less than 25%, maybe medical therapy is an option. And then this uh, study is uh, uh, published in the last year, the end of the last year. Amica trial. So this figure is uh, uh, shows the AFib burden after uh, during the follow up. This is the ablation group. So dark green shows an, uh, if, uh, no AFib burden after ablation, and uh, light green shows an uh, AFib burden less than five percent. So ablation group, 72% of patients had less than 5% of AFib burden. Medical group, 44%. So in terms of uh, uh, rhythm control, ablation was superior to medical therapy. But if you look at LBF, every ejection fraction was similar between two groups. So this, uh, the, the, uh, the results of this study were, uh, were different from uh, previous studies. The, this is probably because they included too many sick patients. 
So NYH class, three patients, 59%, mean LBF was 26%. So if you remember the subgroup analysis of from um, Castle AF, NYH class three and LBF less than 25%, half of patients had a, a very uh, sick patients. This ATAC trial, uh, they, uh, this is also a randomized clinical trial. The end point was, uh, the, uh, the end point of this study was freedom from AFib after, uh, after randomization. Patients were randomized to ablation or amiodarone. And uh, ablation was uh, better than amiodarone. And in this study, they also uh, assessed changes in LV ejection fraction and the six minutes walk distance and quality of life. And the patients without any recurrences, LVF changes in LVF, six minutes walk distance, uh, distance and the quality of life. These changes were greater than patients with uh, without recurrence. So no recurrence patients were better than a recurrence. So of course, heart failure patients, it's better to maintain sinus rate. And ablation is better than a drug therapy. However, this ATAC trial demonstrated predictors of AFib recurrence was LVF. So LVF was low, is uh, lower, ablation success get, will also get lower. And this another study, this study also showed that heart failure patient had a lower rate of, lower rate of uh, uh, freedom from AFib. Why patients with uh, low, low LV ejection fraction had a, a recurrences? That's because a, um, heart failure patients have extensive atrial scarring, not ventricular, atrial scarring. So this study show uh, looking at uh, biatrial voltage areas. Upper panel shows that the heart is from uh, patients with heart failure a lot of, a lot of uh, low voltage in the left atrium and also in the right atrium. So this atrial substrate prevent uh, maintain sinus only by PB isolation. So uh, this, uh, this slide shows that the ablation strategy used in the previous uh, randomized trials come tough trial, they did a PBI isolation, cafe ablation, and linear ablation. So stepwise ablation approach, very uh, aggressive, extensive ablation lesions. ATAC trial, PBI isolation, and uh, posterior wall isolation. Actually, this group did uh, not isolation, debulking of the left atrial posterior, uh, posterior wall, a very large uh, lesion set, and SVC isolation. But the more recent study, uh, PBI only is a 49%, 51%, Castle AF Amica trial. But the half of patients had additional lesions. So these uh, previous studies demonstrate the superiority of uh, ablation therapy over medical treatment, probably because many patients were in sinus rhythm after ablation. But most of patients had it not only PBI, very extensive ablation, probably extensive ablation was effective because uh, a lot of patients had extensive atrial uh, scarring. So the problem of uh, AFib ablation in heart failure patients is we don't know optimal ablation strategy for that high risk patient. If we can, if we can find uh, optimal ablation strategy, maybe we can improve uh, clinical outcomes of heart failure patients with uh, uh, NYH class three. So let me summarize today's talk. So, firstly, patient section 
So LVF less uh, greater than 25%, NYGA class two, these patients may benefit from ablation compared to medical therapy. And of course, we may, we, it's, it's necessary to maintain sinus rhythm after ablation, but long term the persistence may be efficacy of ablation is lower. So of course, pers uh, these patients were not a good indication and not a good candidates for ablation. So timing of ablation as early as possible. If you wait uh, ablation, they get uh, more atrial substrate. But in so some patients are very sick. So some, uh, we often perform uh, electrical cardioversion during uh, hospitalization for heart failure and wait for one or two months if we sinus can maintain. And we wait for uh, patient uh, recovered during that period. That's uh, uh, safer for patients. But uh, if uh, sinus cannot be maintained, and probably uh, we need ablation earlier. And the problem is ablation strategy. So PBA is a cornerstone. So for this, uh, uh, we, uh, no, nobody argued this, uh, this, but uh, definitely some patients, we need uh, uh, something, uh, something uh, ablation strategy adjunctive to PB isolation. So if we can find another a new ablation strategy, uh, we can uh, uh, expand uh, pa patient selection. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. We have uh, time for discussion. So now we got uh, one question from our audience. Okay, Dr. Takashi, the yes. question is that after successful aberration of AF, when LVEF was improved, in case of no AF recurrence, can we stop anti heart failure agent such as beta blocker? That's a question. Thank you for all the question. So that's a uh, yeah, important point. So uh, as I showed today, so some patients uh, one month later, LVF jumped up to 50%, but uh, some patients didn't require uh, longer. So, uh, but, uh, so that's why I, I monitor uh, BNP and um, my clinical practice mm -hmm. and uh, if PNP uh, dropped down, I stopped, uh, firstly, I stopped the uh, diuretics, diuretics. But I, st I, I keep uh, uh, prescribing a beta blocker because some patients have uh, re recurrences and uh, some patients will back with uh, not AP, but atrial flutter. In, th in that case, uh, rate control was more difficult compared to uh, AP. So I think it's better to keep a beta blocker uh, mm -hmm. at least the six month. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we got another question from our audience. The question is that after operation of AF and no recurrence, can you, can we stop anticoagulation therapy? Yeah. Uh, That's a question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, this is a very important uh, issue, but uh, we don't have we don't have enough uh, data to support this uh, uh, support this continuation of anticoagulation. Mm -hmm. Actually, I continue as long as possible if a patient had a heart failure because uh, this the patient will be uh, heart failure will be recovered. Mm -hmm. But if patient had a heart failure recurrence again, some patients will go back to heart failure very easy. Mm -hmm. So uh, if a heart failure, uh, if the patient has a heart failure again, mm -hmm. the child score is uh, at least two. So the, mm -hmm. uh, the patient is re uh, definitely required anticoagulation. So I think it's better to continue. Okay. So I have one question. Yep. As you mentioned, 
in a patient with AF and heart failure with heart failure, HF reduced EF, half ref. Cassie tabulation improved the LV EF. Yes. So I think this good result achieved mainly in patient with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So my question is that when we targeted ischemic cardiomyopathy, whether the improvement of LVEF will be obtained or not. Because the ischemic heart disease is the most frequent cause of heart failure. Thank you. So, uh, so in ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, probably uh, they will not have an increase in uh, LVEF like uh, uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, but uh, there, there is no uh, randomized trial, but uh, from my experience, mm -hmm. this patient will go down mm -hmm. uh, one year, two, or two, two, three years later in terms of LVF or uh, heart failure stage or sometimes more. Um, mm -hmm. more so that's why I think it's better to uh, keep the patient in sinus rhythm. Okay, so yeah. your idea is that that is also effective. Okay, thank yes. you very much. And the last question, are there any significant data with respect to a patient with HFPF, preserved EF, caused by a hypertrophic heart? Are there any data so far? Yes, uh, there is some, uh, I think not only one, several studies, uh, there are several studies, and uh, all the studies uh, demonstrated a superiority of uh, ablation therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So, Dr. Keo, please go ahead. Sado and the first one. All right, thank you very much. I really enjoy your talk, uh -huh. especially your summary slide on who to, which, which patient to, you know, refer for an early ablation. We will now switch gear to devices, and we have uh, Dr. Chi Ye Yu from the Division of Cardiology, Department of Internal Medicine at National Taiwan University Hospital, Taiwan. She will talk to us on leadless and subcutaneous devices, updates, and patient selection. Dr. Yu, please. Okay. Um, so good evening, gen uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really my honor to have this talk with you. Um, so um, I have nothing to disclose. So in the very beginning, I'd like to mention again, though I, I believe you, you all know that why do we need lidless and subcutaneous device? Um, actually, the issue is actually is two parts. One is intravascular, one is lids. So the first thing is the durability. If um, you probably recall that um, earlier the Rieta lead, that um, with time went by the um, insulation break, causing many um, inappropriate uh, shock. And the other thing is the intravascular lead may cause adhesion, um, causing structure distortion or vessel obstruction, including the central vein and tricuspid valves. Also the, the um, lumen in the, uh, the lead, uh, the dead space in the central lumen would prone to uncontrolled infection. So actually it is safer to be away from intravascular system. So what we have on the horizon, um, this is uh, what I will cover in this talk, including Lily's pacemaker, which has no intravascular lead and no subcutaneous generator. And I will cover subcutaneous ICD which has no intravascular lead, but has subcutaneous lead and generator. And I will also mention uh, two uh, small devices, which um, is not really very new, but is uh, or, um, still under evaluation. So first of all, the Lilith pacemaker. On the left-hand side is the um, electronic micro. And um, it is um, probably the only Lilith pacemaker on the market. On the right-hand side is the um, Centromedical Nanostim 
uh, which is uh, because of some problem is still under investigation. The micro has been approved by FDA in 2016. And uh, for the past years, the uh, implementation procedures has in increased a lot. And the micro AV has been uh, approved by FDA in the beginning of this year. Uh, we will talk about it later. So um, um, in 2016, there is um, a very good clinical trial um, show on um, um, single arm uh, observing the micro procedure success. Um, the acute implantation success rate is a 99, oh, sorry, is not, is 99%. And the procedure time is only 28 minutes. Uh, so the procedure is quite safe. And, and with the follow-up, we can see uh, the complication rate, the safety issue. The complication rate reduced almost 50%. Mainly, um, there's no pocket infection because there's no pocket. There's no lead dislodgement because there's no intravascular lead. For the long-term efficacy, you can see the, uh, uh, the pacing threshold is quite stable and the predicted um, battery longevity is more than 12 years. So uh, the micro um, is uh, very uh, good. And for the past four years, there has been there there have been many um, um, observations in many different subgroups. For example, in the very elderly patient, in patient with cardio inhibitory vessel vagal syncope, uh, in patient with cardiac transplant recipient, or in patient with bioprosthetic and repair tricuspid valves. So the safety and efficacy of micro has been um, proved uh, many times in different uh, fragile subgroups. But um, when we considering when we consider implanting this uh, device, we should need to know that um, only VVIR mode is available. Therefore, the, the device is limited to patient with chronic atrial fibrillation with a very rare need for pacing or very frail older adults. If we um, look back the meta-analysis comparing atrial-based pacing or ventricular-based pacing, we, we can know that with ventricular-based pacing like the micro VVI mode, the all-cause mortality or the stroke rate is actually higher than atrial-based pacing. That is what we should pay attention to. And besides, um, you can see on the left, left-hand side figure, um, the, the risk, um, the heart failure hospitalization rate actually increased from very beginning proportional to the RV pacing percentage. So, um, we should pay attention to only RV pacing. So we've been waiting for DDD uh, Lilith pacemaker, but actually in this year, uh, FDA approved the first model of micro AV, the VDD mode. It is based on Marvel 2 study. It is an uh, downloadable algorithm. This is uh, called Marvel 2 algorithm. Um, it has the uh, uh, enhanced accelerometer filtering automatic threshold adjustment and mode switch between VVI 50 and VDD mode. Uh, as you can see the figure here, um, you can see it. Um, there are three time window. One is um, postventricular atrial blanking a3 and A4 with different sensing threshold. So this would enhance the atrial kicking detection. In this study, um, 
there are um, they may, mainly include patients with normal sinus rhythm with complete AV block. Um, there are 40 patients in this study. It is a prospective uh, multi-center clinical trial. In this, um, um, in this figure, we can see the patient's AV synchronous percentage increased from 26.8% in VVI50 mode, and it increased to 89% when it changed to VDD mode. The increase of AV synchronous is very significant. And the AV synchronous percentage can change when uh, with different maneuver, um, it like at resting status, the AV synchronous can achieve 90%. But when the patient like sitting and standing up, the um, AV synchronous drops slightly to 70%. And with time went by, the AV synchrony percentage dropped slightly, but still it is above 80%. There are two surrogates uh, showing the good, good, um, good way of uh, this VDD. For the first one is LVOT velocity time index. It is um, a, uh, a surrogate of left ventricular stroke volume. As you can see with VVI to VDD mode, the VTI increased um, eight, 8.8%. So it um, implies that the stroke volume is increased with VDD mode. Another, uh, another marker to see this is the sinus rate. When uh, the mode changed from VVI50 to VDD, um, the sinus rate reduced a little bit. So with these two, sure, uh, two markers, uh, it represents that the VDD mode of this micro is actually uh, had better score, uh, better performance than VVI50. So um, it looks very good, but uh, when we want to really um, implant this micro AV to the patient, we still need to considering um, still need to consider some question. The first, the first one is. Um, the AV synchrony percentage is 89%. It is very good, but is it good enough? Because um, when we compare it with the traditional transvenous DDD pacemaker, um, the AV synchrony is actually almost 100%. So is 89% good enough? Um, this is what we should think about. And the other thing is the battery drain. Um, because the AV, um, the Marvel 2 study, they use a, a um, downloadable algorithm into uh, pre-existing pre micro in the patient. So uh, we do not know the battery drain um, in these patients. So this, uh, I, I, ap I apologize that I, do not find the uh, related data, but I believe when the micro AV is on the market uh, quickly, we, very soon we will know the, the data. So um, FOO is still, a, there's still no HO pacing. So we, sh we should still know that this mode is not suitable for a sick sign syndrome, um, which is the indication for the majority of the patients. The second device is the cutaneous ICD. Um, this ICD is actually not a new device. It has been approved in 2012. Um, for the past 10 years, there are a few studies um, showing the efficacy and safety. But um, the most thing that many people concern is the high inappropriate shock rate. So, um, in uh, 2016, there are a comparison. It is uh, a head-to-head -head comparison between subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD. 
as you can see on the left hand side, uh, the transvenous ICD has uh, more, um, I should say, the subcutaneous ICD has less lead complication, but has more non lead related complications. So, after all, the primary uh, endpoint of subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD is actually has no significant difference. But if we look, okay, so, so uh, when we are um, considering subcutaneous ICD, uh, we still have to uh, know that there is lack of ventricular pacing. It cannot perform anti-tachycardia pacing for monomorphic VT and it also cannot perform pacing for bradycardia. And because there's no uh, lead in the atrium, so there's no atrial pacing and no atrial arrhythmia differentiation uh, mode. And the third thing is the battery longevity is still a concern because um, nowadays the new uh, the, the newer generation of uh, transvenous ICD can have longevity like 10 years, but the subcutaneous ICD has still uh, shorter battery longevity, like less than six years. Also, the subcutaneous pulse generator is actually larger than uh, traditional ICD. And after all, the cost is quite high compared to transvenous ICD. And uh, the reason I want to mention this is there are actually two um, studies presented on HIS uh, this year, uh, a, a late breaking trial session. Um, but um, for these two studies, I can, because their paper has have not published, so I actually could not find the figures, but I can um, report some uh, data from their talk. Well, the first one is Praetorian. Praetorian is actually the first randomized trial of subcutaneous ICD and transvenous ICD. It is conduct a multi-center study. Uh, 80, 849 patients are included. Most of them are ischemic cardiomyopathy. The median ejection fraction was 30% and most of them are primary prevention. So uh, the most important thing is the patient has to have no need for pacing. And for the median follow-up of four years, um, the subcutaneous ICD is shown to be non-inferior to transvenous device in terms of, of a composite of inappropriate shock and ICD-related complication. Um, but uh, though the composite has no significant difference, but uh, if we look at the detail, the, uh, the, the subcutaneous actually has still, um, the, transvenous, the transvenous arm has uh, more AFib or SVT tachycardia uh, related in upper shock, but subcutaneous ICD has higher uh, cardiac oversensing related in upper shock. For the ICD related complication, the transvenous ICD has higher number of infection while the subcutaneous ICD have more bleeding. Each one has their own issue, but the composite is actually the same. So um, another uh, trial called Untouched. It is not a, um, there's only one arm and observational study. It is a multi-center study, more than 1,000 implantation. The observation is the mean age uh, is 56 and um, most, almost half of them had is ischemic ideology and the LV ejection fraction is 26%. Uh, again, they don't have pacing indication and the follow-up time is uh, 18 months. So uh, with the 
Uh, the primary endpoint is freedom from inappropriate shock. Um, so actually the inappropriate shock rate is high, very high. It's almost 96%. Um, it, it is higher than the cut point 91%, which is um, derived from medit rich trial. So the performance is actually uh, better than the transvenous ICD. And also the an annual inappropriate uh, in shock rate is 31%. And with the latest generation subcutaneous ICD, it can go down to 2.4%. Um, the latest generation has a smart pass filter, uh, which is more smart is smarter than the old generation in differentiation. Also, the shock success rate is very high. The final, the first shock success rate and the final shock success rate is very high, and the overall survival rate is ninety five percent. One thing I want to mention is um, there was one death that is related to a systole. So in other words, if the patient was implanted with a transvenous ICD, um, actually the uh, a systole related deaths can be prevented. So the concern of the subcutaneous ICD is that uh, um, it's mainly, um, it is mainly in studied in primary prevention patients. And this is easily understood because uh, for secondary prevention patients, most of them need to be paced. Um, so the second thing is we have to make sure the patient doesn't need pacing. And also we may have to make sure the patient doesn't need CRT. Also with a subcutaneous ICD, we still have to uh, consider the shorter longevity and the higher cost. Uh, okay, um, so another two small things that need, um, worth to be mentioned is wireless LV endocardial pacing and substernal pacing. This is the wise CRT system. So there are three components. One is the receiver. Um, so the battery powers the transmitter and the, the transmitter synchronized with RV pacing pulse to transmit ultrasound energy to the receiver electrode. So the receiver electrode can pace the ventricle. This is the wise CRT system. And uh, this is the observational study, the select LV study. As you, um, this study, uh, uh, the enrollment of the patient, they need to have failed CRT, which means the CSD implantation was not feasible or the patient is a CRT non-responder. So among these critical patients, you can see still with this system, the patient's EF can improve uh, with six months and the LV and diastolic volume can reduce at six months. And also on the right-hand side, you can see the, CR, uh, the response rate can go up to 85% which is very good compared to traditional CRT. Another small thing is the substernal defibrillator with casing, pacing capacity. This is the design of the lead. It has two ring electrode and two high voltage coil. And it is put into from here, substernal to the ritual sternal area. So when it is connected to the patch, we can see the uh, uh, defibrillation rate, the success is very high. So um, the, the, the good thing of this lead is it can sense the ventricle and it can pace the ventricle. So it can offer anti-tachycardia pacing. Okay, so this is the last slide. So with this figure, we can see there are very many small littlest thing. They are very small in size with this littlest pacemaker and the wide CRT system and also the subcutaneous ICD. So um, um, 
eventually they can communicate uh, with each other and they can take care of our heart harmonically. So uh, I believe this is our future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Yu, for your very uh, detailed update on the technology out there. I'm afraid in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next lecture. But for those who are attending, please feel free to type in your questions to the Q&A, and we'll try our best to answer them. Now, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Hong Yulin from Halen University Sacred Heart Hospital from South Korea. He will talk to us on pulmonary vein stenosis <clears throat> problem. Dr. Lin, please. Thank you, Chairman, and hello, colleagues. I'm Dr. Lin from Harlem University Hospital in Korea. Today, I'd like to present the pulmonary vein PV stenosis or occlusion in single shot ablation technique era. There is no disclosure. If you look at the images before ablation and after ablation, you can clearly see the luminal narrowing in left inferior pulmonary vein here and totally obstructed left inferior pulmonary vein here. We call these PV stenosis or PV occlusion respectively. The prevalence of PV stenosis was as high as 42% in focal or segmental ablation technique within the venous OCL themselves. The incidence of severe PV stenosis has decreased to between 0.32% and 3.4% with wide area circumferential enteral ablation technique. However, the true incidence of PV stenosis in the modern ablation era is not well understood because current HRS consensus statement do not recommend routine post-ablation screening for PV stenosis. Symptomatic patients may come to attention months after their initial AFib ablation procedure. Otherwise, delaying diagnosis has major adverse implications related to progression of the stenosis and severe intraparenchymal lung damage as well. This paper published in circulation in, in circulation 2016 was a prospective observational study of 124 patients with severe PV stenosis evaluated between 2000 and 2014 in Mayo Clinic, United States. 219 PVs were identified as having severe PV stenosis by computed tomography scan. Interestingly, consolidation or ground grace appearance, appearance was only found 25% with chest X-ray and 55% in HLCT. Therefore, chest X-ray or HLCT is not a good imaging modality for diagnosis of PV stenosis. Majority of patients with severe PV stenosis have various symptoms. Of these, more than one third of patients have dyspnea at rest or exertional dyspnea. Almost half of them have cough, fatigue, and discrete exercise tolerance. More than one fourth of patients have hemoptysis. Median time from ablation to symptom onset was four months and median time from onset of symptoms to final PV stenosis diagnosis was 3.3 months. Therefore, PV stenosis should be taken, in, taken into account when patient who receiving the AFib ablation have any uh, respiratory symptoms. Majority except 11 patients who have no symptom or refuge pulmonary intervention received balloon angioplasty with or without stent implantation. As you can see, least stenosis rate was 56% in balloon angioplasty group, whereas 27% in stent implantation group, which are still very high than we expected. Mean diameter of balloon or stent was 10 millimeter, and mean length of balloon or stent was almost 20 millimeter. Procedural complication rate almost 
Majority was the bleeding related complication, including hemoptysis, tamponade, pericardial pleural effusion, and pericardial effusion. This logic stent was found in 5% in patients who received stent implantation. This, this is a couple of my covers for listenosis rate in balloon angioplasty group versus stent implantation group. As you can see, least tenacious rate was significantly higher in balloon angioplasty group compared to the stent implantation group during median follow-up of 4.6 years. PV stenosis is an underrecognized syndrome that can result in significant and debilitating symptoms. Early identification of PV stenosis is crucial, but relies on obtaining appropriate imaging. The symptoms of PV stenosis can be confused for other pulmonary diseases, which can lead to misdiagnosis. Because routine screening for PV stenosis has decreased, maintaining a suspicion is key for early and acute diagnosis. Invasive management with balloon angioplasty or stenting is highly effective in the acute setting, but the risk of recurrence is very, very high. Stenting significantly reduces the risk of PV least tenosis in comparison with balloon angioplasty. Despite these encouraging findings, least tenosis still occurs in more than one fourth of those who treated with a stent. There is a significant need for research into method for improving outcomes for PV stenosis, including the use of new technologies such as a drug coated balloon or stent. When it comes to the aspect of uh, procedure itself, we have known for two obvious evidences for prevention of PV stenosis. One is do not ablate within the ostium of each PV. The second, as long as we can, if she lateral intra ablation would be better than circumferential each PV ablation. However, we still don't know which whether the single shot ba balloon based ablation is better than point by point catapultive ablation. Which energy sources, including cryo, RF, laser, first field, are better for prevention of PV stenosis? And is a pow high power short duration is better than conventional RF ablation setting ablation? Still, we don't know yet. In terms of energy sources, there are two fundamental mechanisms for tissue necrosis. One is thermal ablation modality. The other is non-thermal ablation modality. Thermal ablation modalities include cryo, RF, and laser. Non-thermal ablation modality is pulsed field ablation. Traditional thermal ablation modalities such as RF and cryothermy rely on thermal extremes that are inherently indiscriminate in tissue destruction and then can develop collateral damages such as esophageal also or fistula and plane of paralysis. First field ablation selectively creates microscopic pores in cell membranes by delivering a first electrical field to the target tissue. Cardiomyocytes appears to be particularly vulnerable to first field ablation compared with other tissues permitting preferential myocardial damage. First field ablation may avoid complications associated with thermal based ablation method. This interesting paper published in Heart Rhythm a few weeks ago, four weeks ago, the assessed the PV narrowing in first field ablation court group versus RF ablation court group. CT scan at three months after following a fib ablation was conducted in all enrolled population to measure PB osteal diameters after ablation. As you can see, quantitative as well as qualitative analysis was conducted in this patient in this paper. Moderate and severe stenosis was found 3% in RF ablation group, whereas the no one was found in first field ablation. Mild stenosis was found in 11.4% in RF ablation group, whereas 0.8% in first field ablation group. This is another interesting paper published in Circulation Journal 2018. 
to uh, assess the PB stenosis rate in RF ablation group versus cryo balloon ablation group versus laser balloon ablation group. If you look at the upper graphs, the risk of significant PB stenosis was very low, irrespective of different energy sources. However, the incidence of mild pulmonary vein stenosis is highest in laser balloon ablation group and lowest in cryo balloon ablation group. When you see the low graph, LIPB is more vulnerable for cryo balloon ablation group and LSPB as well as LIPB was more vulnerable for laser balloon ablation group, whereas RSPB follow, followed by LSPB was more vulnerable for RF ablation group. I think the shape or flexibility of balloon itself may be the main reason for more vulnerable for PB stenosis in radio or hot balloon compared to the cryo balloon. If you look at the left figure, the contact area may be more inside of osteo, PB osteum in radio or hot balloon compared to the cryo balloon. They may, I, I think that they may be more soft and deformable and squeezable than compared to the cryo balloon. But this is only possible explanation because I have no experience of laser or hot balloon ablation so far. As you know, the PB stenosis still occurs in cryo balloon ablation. The incidence of PB stenosis by cryo balloon ablation was approximately 3.1% using a first generation balloon most of, most of which were treated by a 23 millimeter balloon. However, there is an unavoidable risk of PB stenosis even with a 28 millimeter second generation cryo balloon ablation. So far, we have done more than 350 cases of with a 28 millimeter second generation cryo balloon ablation. There is only single, only one case with severe PB stenosis after ablation. The possible mechanism may be the bottom of LIPB osteum or the roof of LS, LSPB osteum could be lifted up or pulled down during cryoballoon ablation in LSPB or LIPB, especially in common left PB with relatively smaller the osteum of less than 30 millimeter. The high pressure used to occlude the PB might have caused the PB stenosis in long common left PB. As you can see, long common left PB could be shrunk, looked like candy wrapper in patient with long common left PB with osteal diameter of less than 30 millimeter. As you know, there are the different PB anatomies of which left common PB is not uncommon. There are two types of left common PB. One is short common, the other is long common, as you, look and see, as you can see. If the osteal diameter of left common PB is more than, much more than 30 millimeter, cryoballoon ablation could be done with the, the, safely because the, the space is between the cryoballoon, the osteum of the opposite PB is too wide. Therefore, Cryoballoon ablation in this case is safely done. However, the OCL diameter of left common PB is 30 millimeter or less. The bottom of LIPB could be lifted up and the roof of LSPB could be pulled down when occluding, when freezing the opposite PB. Also, the long common PB could be shrunk, looked like a candy wrapper when you pushing, when you push the balloon too strong, too hard. These are typical example of intracardiac echocardiography while a 28 millimeter cryoballoon ablation in normal PB anatomy. As you can clearly see, the 28 millimeter cryoballoon was occluding in the LSPB here and LIPB here. You can clearly see the osteum of LIPB and LSPB here. The distance between the osteum and the cryoballoon is very wide. However, if you look at the IC image, the measured diameter of 
osteal, measured osteal diameter was 26.5 millimeter here. And you can clearly see left common, long common PB looks like here. You can also measure, roughly measure by the eye using the achieved catheter because the diameter of achieved catheter is almost 20 millimeter. So this is a common left PB and the OCL diameter is less than 30 millimeter. The, as you know, the diameter of cryoballoon became become bigger when inflation of liquid nitrogen. So if you look at the ice image, the 28 millimeter cryo balloon do not, could not be entered into the osteal, osteum of the left common primary vein because the osteal diameter is almost less than 30 millimeter, 26.5 millimeters so far. In that case, do not push balloon too strong, just contact is enough to isolate both primary veins simultaneously. Do not push too long, too hard. In this, eye, in this case, the measured the di OCL diameter was 29.8 millimeter. And you can clearly see the, the cryo balloon occluding the LI PV here. And you can also clearly see the blood flow with red color from the LSPV. There is a narrow space between the balloon and the osteum of LSPV here. But however, the when freezing, when freezing, the balloon is became bigger and you cannot see any space between the osteum of LSPV and the balloon here. So the primary vein stenosis could be developed in this case when you push the balloon too strong. The measured osteal diameter is 33.4 millimeter here. And you can clearly see the cryo balloon occluding LSPB here, occluding LIPB here. You can clearly see the blood flow with the red color from LIPB here and LSPB here. In that case, you don't worry about the PB stenosis at all. So let me conclude my presentation. Symptoms regarding PB stenosis developing during various periods, usually three to six months following AF ablation. The occurrence and severity of symptoms are related both to the degree of luminal narrowing and to the number of affected PVs. Identification of slowly progressing PV stenosis in follow-up visit is challenging due to lower diagnostic yield of chest X-ray. Appropriate ablation technique for targeting the outside PV ostia is most important to prevent PV stenosis. We don't know yet whether or not the ablation strategy, including different RF setting, different energy sources, different techniques influenced PB stenosis. Bigger balloon is not always better for prevention of PB stenosis, especially in common left PB with a relatively small osteal diameter. Whether the presence of common left PB osteum increases the risk of PB stenosis after single shot balloon ablation technique remains unclear. However, this possibility warrants consideration for further investigation. I am pretty confident the use of ice during a formulation is very, very helpful to prevent PB stenosis. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Lin, for a very nice and elegant talk and update on primary vein stenosis and occlusion. Uh, you, Dr. Like Kyung, the... please release a uh, mute. Yeah, now, the... you can understand. Can you hear me now? Oh, no, we can hear. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So yeah, Dr. Lin, thank you for a very nice talk on PV stenosis and occlusion. You have presented a lot of images and very good eye images on common left pulmonary vein, a common off. Um, you explained how a balloon tactic with eyes could reduce the occurrence of PV stenosis. Um, do you find that with a common off on the left side using balloon technology? Uh, needs more freezing and application of cryoablation. As you could see, there are flow, you know, across various veins in those with large left pulmonary common off. Dr. Lin. 
Actually, I can hear you clearly, so I don't understand what you are asking, but uh, in common PVEs, usually the cryoburn is safely done, but uh, in small LA, especially in the OCL diameter is less than 30 millimeter, we usually perform the segmental entry ovulation using the cryoburn because we push the balloon against the PV, the PV stenosis could be developed. So in that case, especially in the low, the smaller LA, we usually perform the entral ablation using the cryo balloon segmental ablation. All right, so in your segmental cryo ablation approach, does the ablation time significantly increase for such anatomy? No, no, it's the same. Actually, the ablation time is almost 40 minutes. So only the PBI isolation, but uh, the, when it comes to the, to the technical aspect, the PB isolation in the usually normal PB anatomy, the mean time is the, the same, 40 minutes, and the in common PB also the mean time is the 40 minutes. The procedure time is not affected in the common PB or, that, or not. A related question would be if would point by point radio frequency ablation for the less common off be a bit uh, a safer approach compared to cryo ablation? Both safe. In my opinion, actually, I have done more than 3,000 3, AFib ablations so far. So RF ablation is okay and cryo ablation is okay in common PB. You don't worry about that because the one thing you keep in mind, the don't push too hard in common PB. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Lim, I have a brief question. Yes. To avoid a PV stenosis, which technique is the best? So currently we have uh, four techniques, prior operations, hot barrel operation, laser operation, and conventional RF operations. Which technique is the best? I oh. don't care the cost. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I actually, actually, I don't care. The, I don't care because the cryo is is safely done in common left PB. So RF is good and cryoablation good, but I have actually, unfortunately, I have no experience of laser or hot balloon ablation so far, but the cryoablation is safely done in common left PB. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, all right, uh, thank you so much for your good answers and sharing of tips and tricks in performing safe ablation for AFib. I'm afraid uh, the time has come to call this session to an end. You've been attending the APSC JCS 2002 webinar for New Horizon in Arrhythmia. I want to thank my co-chair and all the speakers for their wonderful talks that give us an update to the current technology in treating arrhythmias in patients uh, with heart diseases. Thank you so much, and I wish you a good evening. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>